I may well be the light relief here in the conversation because I'm possibly the only person in the room who's not actively involved in investment management, fund management, or the allocation of capital to different kind of competing asset classes. But what I am very much involved with is comparative analysis of cities. And in particular, I specialize in comparing how different cities look if you use the lens of the 157 different global indexes or rankings of cities that are now published every year, including the official data such as the Eurostat, the OECD, the UN Habitat, but also all of these other studies that now happen, the Globalization and World Cities Group, of course the work that's produced by various organizations that are in the room, but other things as well, and there are now um, from McKinney Kinsey, uh, and from a, a number of other groups, some, some excellent <coughs> rankings. So what I do is I specialize in looking at those rankings and using them to look at cities. The second thing that sort of started my interest in this is, of course, that with increasing allocations of international capital to cities, there has evolved a, an agenda that goes something like um, there's too much money chasing too little asset, and as a result, a very small number of cities are becoming saturated with capital, and there are negative externalities associated with that, not just inflation, but also how you compete to find asset. Uh, and at the same time, of course, uh, those cities are often the cities that have other challenges, the challenges of congestion, the challenges of inflation, the challenges uh, that, that go with growth and success. And so the narrative goes, um, we should look for a second tier of cities, a second tier of cities that have specialized functions, have high quality assets, have another kind of investment proposition uh, attached to them. And those are the cities we should look at to complement our portfolio of investments in the first tier cities. Well, I think that's a very interesting narrative, but I think it's missing a conversation, which is, do we actually understand who are the first tier cities very well? And may there be, in fact, some places that are first tier cities, but are not recognized as such. And that's the conversation or the question that I brought to my recent uh, work with the G4 cities, trying to understand the question, is this for small, high-quality cities with their own markets, or is this, in fact, another member of the first tier of global city regions? And if it's the, the latter rather than the former, what are the implications of that in terms of investment opportunities? So I'm going to talk about four cities that comprise, I think, one regional market. I'll focus a little bit on what are the common factors between them, but I'd also like to talk a little bit about their complementary assets and what their combined scale is. If we start with combined scale, you see the key number down at the bottom is the population number. The, the four cities together, the four metropolitan areas, just over 7.5 million people. 7.5 million people with a GDP uh, in, in Euro billions of, of nearly uh, 300, uh, an area of uh, 9,000 square kilometers, and all of the things that you already know about the economic assets and the key infrastructure. And if you want to, we could say that these complementary assets are the individual DNA of these four very interesting cities. I, I won't read these things out. I think you know what is Amsterdam, what is Rotterdam, what is Utrecht, and, and what is The Hague. But the combined scale and these complementary assets means that they do have the sorts of things required of a world-class global city region. They have the international connectivity, they have the prestigious institutions, they have the decision-making operations, they have the corporate hub, they have the knowledge-based institutions, they have the innovation economy and the corporate economy, they have the livability and they have the scale. So it's all there, and I want to talk to you about it. There are also some very important common factors, I think, the, the can-do Dutch spirit that you know all about, but a business and investment climate that is carefully nuanced towards the needs of international capital, and in particular, the needs towards global talent, the needs towards uh, highly globalizing, fast-paced, innovative sectors, and the focus very much on institutional capital into fixed assets. You'll hear much more about that. 
Later on, I'll describe connectivity as the secret weapon of this region. And you'll see when I show you graphically how it compares that uh, this is the region with the best connectivity in the world. You'll also, of course, know that quality of life is superb, stability is there, openness to uh, the international realm is, of course, part of the DNA. Let's just ask the question, what does it look like as an economic hub? And again, I'm comparing with the cities uh, uh, on the graph here on the right-hand side. You see that what I call BDC here, which is really a, a, just a terminology for the G4, if you look at them combined, bigger economies than Munich, Madrid, and Stockholm region, um, about half the size of London and Paris, sixth in Europe. That's because Istanbul and Moscow come into these figures, but very much part of that first tier. And if you look at the population growth rate projections on the left-hand side, you'll see that we're, we're heading for 8 million people by 2024 overall. If you look at the connectivity equation here, you can see that between Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Utrecht and The Hague, you have this very high-paced uh, connectivity. And if you compare that on the right-hand side to the, the global uh, infrastructure story, as I say uh, in, the, uh, in the underlined sentence right at the end, the G4 would be the top city in the world for infrastructure and connectivity without rival. There isn't a place that is better connected than this place if you treat it as one urban region and you think about it in that way. Just let me illustrate the point. Here's the G4 versus the Ile-de-France Paris region. The connectivity there is considered great. That's one region around one city. Compare it to the G4, one region with four cities offering you the same connectivity as the Ile-de-France, which is the second most connected region in the world. But if you want to compare it to the Munich metropolitan area, G4 is better. If you want to compare it, of course, to the Frankfurt metropolitan area, G4 much better. Compare it to the Stockholm business region, G4 much better. So in the same geography that we think of as being a single metropolitan region with a single, a single central city, you have four cities that are better connected than the outskirts of those metropolitan regions are with their core city. Now, if you think about the globalization score, here I draw on the globalization and world cities group, what you can see is that the four cities themselves are all amongst the top 200 in the world, but only Amsterdam on its own is in the top 100. However, if you aggregate the data, and this is what I'm going to do in the next 10 slides, you see that this region becomes about the 10th most globalized region in the world. So it puts it together on a par with Sydney or Chicago. It puts it up there, touching the heights of the Singapore's and the Hong Kong's and others. In other words, the global reach of this region is equivalent to any other top 10 world city you wish to talk about. Think about the labor market capacity, and again, I've done the same thing here of aggregating the figures. I show you the individual cities on the left-hand side, the G4 numbers on the right-hand side, combined, and again, this includes Istanbul and Moscow, so remember that, employment levels are the sixth ranked in Europe overall, rivaling Paris and London. Look at the figures there in terms of both the S&T employment and also the, uh, the, the, the other employment. That's a science and technology base. So a very high knowledge economy quotient in the labor market and high numbers of employment overall. Think about the universities now. You know that the G4 hosts a number of world-class universities. Amsterdam on its own has two. Utrecht has one. Rotterdam has one putting them all together and allowing the combined assets to operate on a cross-border basis, the G4 becomes um, a, a university region that surpasses Paris, competes with London and San Francisco and Boston, and is in the top tier of the world's knowledge economy. That's because many of the institutions have a location in more than one metropolitan area. When you combine them, you get that one plus one plus two equals six. Very clever. 
Uh, if we think about research and innovation, which is the other big topic that we're concerned with, if you pool the resources again here, you see uh, in my chart the way the individual cities score in the various rankings of the innovation economy. What you have then here, the G4 overall, probably would come out to be uh, somewhere one, two, three, or four in Europe a top 10 uh, knowledge economy region uh, in the world, and potentially Europe's most important innovation hub. Very important because the spread from clean tech to biosciences to digital economy to med tech across through the other innovative sectors, including the food sectors, of course, as well as including the kind of urban design, engineering, globally traded urban services. These are all present in the region, and therefore it has a broadly based innovation ecosystem, as we like to call it, which is able to support a number of sectors, and they're able to cross-fertilize with each other. In terms of destination, the G4 is already a fabulous destination, as you can see. Look at the cities on their own on the left-hand side of my chart. Look at them on the right-hand side. A conference destination that would be ranked number two in the world. Second only to Paris, and only just second to Paris, better than Singapore, London, Vienna, as a place for conferences and for visitors of that kind. Quality of life, you can see here, look, just jump to the conclusion very quickly, low crime, wonderful cultural facilities, cosmopolitan lifestyle, more livable than Zurich and Barcelona, Copenhagen and Sydney, if you combine the assets. Uh, smart, smartness, sustainability, uh, this com combination uh, of the four cities comes out as being a world-class performer, very low combined carbon emissions per capita, more sustainable than Berlin, Vienna and Oslo, all cities that have a reputation uh, for these kinds of things. Investment magnet, you can look here very clearly from the Cushman and Wakefield studies to the JLL studies, the ULI studies. Don't want to leave anyone out. KPMG, LaSalle Investment Managers, they're all there. Okay, You can see all of these studies, but what you can see is that individually these cities perform well for FDI potential. But when you put them together, they stand out as a very globally attractive region. Uh, particularly in this area of human capital, business-friendly uh, FDI processes. So this is the last couple of slides. I've been trying to tell you that the connectivity of the region gives it a secret weapon that allows you to treat this region as if it were one global city region. And if you treat it as such, it has all of these unique advantages that nobody really knew. The history and the character and the global orientation come together with these complementary specializations that we highlighted at the start. We have an incredible human diversity that gives it both a cosmopolitan feel, but also some kind of global dynamism and competitiveness in terms of trade, globally traded sectors, the innovation quotients that come from that. Absolutely world-beating infrastructure, which we've already said. This is not just about Schiphol and the port of Rotterdam. This is about uh, all of the ports, all of the airports, the internal rail and road connectivity, and the highest level of internet usage in the world of any population. The distributed polycentric character, now this is where the spatial planners wake up, the polycentric character of the region means it's able to grow without suffering from the same problems of center city concentration that the other cities suffer from. In other words, you can have in this region distributed growth, which is more sustainable and has fewer externalities associated with it. Not so much pollution, not so much inflation, not so many difficulties in, in assembling um, portfolios. It, it, it has that ability to be a flexible place for growth. The world-class institutions you know all about. We only talk about the, the Hague briefly as you know, the, the, the top of the world's system of peace and justice or the European home of the UN. And you remember these institutions along with the universities. And then, of course, this can-do Dutch spirit. So here's the last slide. It's really to make the point that the very special character of this place means, unfortunately, that most of the time that you look at data about cities, you see these four places down the rankings because their scores are separated and segregated. 
if you put them together, I believe correctly, because of the connectivity into a combined score, then what you come up with is a highly distinctive, livable, sustainable uh, world city region that should be a major attractor uh, of investment. And from that point of view, I believe that this world city region belongs in that top tier, along with London and Paris and New York and Hong Kong. But it's never communicated as such. So I leave you with the observation, perhaps the thought, that there's a major opportunity to invest in this region with quality, scale, with sustainability, and with the flexibility to grow over several cycles. So thank you very much.